2016 was the hottest year on record, topping a decade of increasingly warmer years. Powerful storms, heat waves, rising sea levels, melting glaciers, declining ice caps, and drought stalked the planet. There's anywhere from a 97 to 99% consensus among the world's scientists uh, studying this problem that climate change is real and human caused. The office of President of the United States. Yet how did a climate change denier get elected President of the United States? Trump's win has created a fossil fuel field day. Donald Trump has claimed that climate change is an expensive hoax. This summer, he announced the United States was pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. The bottom line is that the Paris Accord is very unfair at the highest level to the United States. Even before that dramatic move, Trump had already signed an executive order rolling back former President Barack Obama's climate regulations. It reverses the previous administration's Arctic leasing ban. Trump wants to see a revitalization of the coal industry. Over the past two years, I've spent time with the miners all over America. He plans to scrap NASA's climate research program and has approved the Keystone XL pipeline, which would route oil from Alberta's tar sands to the Gulf of Mexico. When completed, the Keystone XL pipeline will span 900 miles, wow. He has also set out to gut the Environmental Protection Agency. First of all, I want to congratulate Scott Pruitt, who's here someplace, where is Scott? <laughs> Appointing a climate change denier, Scott Pruitt, to run it. Pruitt has been a, a skeptic, is the term that they like to use of climate change. Human activity on the climate is something very challenging to do, and there's trem tremendous disagreement about the, the degree of impact. Uh, so, so no, I would not agree uh, that it's a primary contributor uh, to, the, to the global warming that we see. The fact that climate change deniers now inhabit the most powerful positions in the world's most powerful government is no accident. Or that most Americans don't perceive that global warming poses a catastrophic threat. This is largely the handiwork of two brothers, David and Charles Koch. The Kochs are gonna have a lot more influence in any Republican administration. Ken Vogel is an investigative reporter in Washington, D.C. He has followed the Koch brothers for years. They're thrilled that uh, Donald Trump won and, and Hillary Clinton lost, but I think they're even surprised by how much uh, ability they have to shape the Trump administration. For the most part, this is going to be incredibly beneficial for the Kochs, and the best measure of that so far is how many people are working for the Trump administration who were, over their careers, supported by the Kochs. Just who are the Koch brothers? The Koch brothers are two of the wealthiest individuals in the United States. David and Charles Koch own Koch Industries, a $100 billion conglomerate based in Kansas that refines, transports, and sells oil. The company also is into chemicals, minerals, paper products, and commodities trading, employing 100,000 people in more than 60 countries. And it controls one to two million acres of Alberta's tar sands, the third largest reserve of oil in the world. The Cokes are a vertically integrated fossil fuel conglomerate, and they have a vertically integrated influence peddling apparatus to go with it. Indeed, the Cokes are more than just about selling oil. One of the goals of the Koch political network is to get Republicans elected to office and the occasional Democrat. They have a vast network now, a political network that rivals the other parties. They're bigger than the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in their organizing might. Senator Ron Johnson will beat back a challenge from Democrat Russ Feingold. In a During last November's election, the Koch spent hundreds of millions of dollars on key congressional and Senate seats. Republicans from all across the country are going to be marching to your door to figure out <laughs> how you came from what, a 10-point deficit? Which was likely critical for the Republicans' retaining 
maintaining control of both chambers of Congress. You know, we, we won because of the work we did for the people of Ohio. Even as the Kochs were not a major factor in their direct spending on the presidential race, the infrastructure that they set up around the country did have an impact on getting voters, getting their type of voters out to the polls, and that probably did have an impact on not only the Senate race, but also even in the presidential race. They supported and focused on about eight Senate campaigns, and I believe seven of the eight that they supported won. Most of these were fairly critical Senate seats. This monster of a storm system is the remnants of a powerful Pacific typhoon. While Trump and the Republicans, with the encouragement of the Koch brothers, are rolling back climate change measures, global temperatures keep climbing. Australia's record-breaking heat wave is continuing to fuel outbreaks of wildfires across scores of thousands of hectares in the southeast of the country. The worst predictions keep coming true. So you're looking at an unprecedented drought in the west. You're looking at extreme weather all over the place. The water level at Oradell Reservoir is nearly immeasurable. Four years ago, carbon dioxide passed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere the highest level in more than 4 million years. Scientists now forecast temperatures will rise 2.5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit over the next century. The science around global climate disruption is 97%. While NASA predicts this will mean more severe weather and impact on communities worldwide, the U.S. Republican-controlled Congress and Senate refused to take action, voting down the McCain-Lieberman climate change bills and refusing to vote on the Paris Agreement. The United States Congress is the single biggest obstacle to the global resolution of climate change. The U.S. Congress and Senate's inaction on climate change was by design. That gulf between scientific opinion and public opinion has been bought with hundreds of millions of dollars of special interest money. In the mainstream media, Chris, there is a denial of the growing skepticism in the scientific community about global warming. Well, the campaign to sow doubt about climate change and prevent meaningful action began decades ago particularly as the science became more certain. Your party wants to be credible on yeah. science. You've got to accept science, do you? Yeah, I, accept always wanted, science. I always wanted to play and inherit the wind. But... In 1988, NASA climatologist James Hansen testified in front of Congress. The greenhouse effect has been detected, and it is changing our climate now. Climatologists like Michael Mann at Penn State University discovered that temperatures had risen by 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit since the late 1800s. Two-thirds of that warming has occurred since 1975. The observations were showing that there was a prominent warming trend in the data uh, that was outside of what we would expect from natural climate variability. Yet long before climate scientists began raising alarm about global warming in the 1980s and 90s, scientists who worked for the oil industry had realized years earlier that burning fossil fuels would cause climate change. From what we understand, the oil industry was aware of climate impacts and, and climate science decades ago. ExxonMobil in particular is, was actually conducting cutting edge climate science research um, decades ago. Exxon scientists warned the company this warming was caused by burning fossil fuels and that the consequences would be catastrophic. But Exxon, along with other oil companies, hid this information from the public. The oil industry embarked on a campaign of deception and disinformation. The whole strategy is about creating doubt, making the public, making politicians, making political leaders feel that we don't really know for sure whether or not this is a problem. Harvard University science historian Naomi Oreskes studies how the oil industry creates doubt about climate change. So if you can create doubt in people's minds, you can delay action. 
So that's what this is all about. During the 90s and the 2000s, ExxonMobil and a number of oil companies were well known for funding climate denial activities. The oil industry used the same methods in even the very same public relations firms that tobacco companies employed to spread doubt about the dangers of smoking. We do know that some of the key people who began challenging climate science, who began denying climate science in the late 1980s, had previously worked for the tobacco industry. We know that they began to use the same strategies and tactics, often the same arguments, the same vocabulary. A driving force behind spreading doubt was the American Petroleum Institute. API is the lobbying arm of the oil industry. In 1998, API wrote an internal memo that said victory would be achieved when average citizens understand uncertainties in climate science. The industry at large spent something like a, over a half billion dollars sort of disseminating doubt and basically trying to confuse people in the United States. However, companies like Exxon eventually stopped financing climate denial groups because of pressure from environmental organizations. Exxon had to back off, and in about 2005, 6, and 7, they stopped funding the very groups that they had been sending millions to in the years prior, and they dropped them like a hot potato. In the meantime, the Koch money came in. The Koch brothers quickly filled the void with even harsher methods. Perhaps their greatest achievement is helping convince the world that global warming doesn't exist. Greenpeace soon dubbed the brothers' apparatus the climate change denial machine. It's a network of corporations and think tanks, front groups. They are arguably the biggest sugar daddies of the fossil fuel front groups that have gotten tremendous traction. Charles Koch has said that even if the planet is warming, it will not have catastrophic consequences, and argues climate scientists' models for future warming are faulty. The Koch brothers have spent, at this point, $80 million on climate denial front groups. Uh, that money has been focused at both the federal and state level. The Koch brothers' politics was shaped by their father, Fred Koch, a chemical engineer who grew up in Texas and seems to have had few scruples. Back in the 1930s, Fred invented a new kind of technology to refine oil. He had a hard time getting work in the U.S., and so he tried to find work elsewhere in the world and ended up selling his process to very unlikely um, sources. Jane Mayer is an investigative reporter for the New Yorker magazine in Washington, D.C., and author of Dark Money, a best-selling book about the Koch brothers. Quite ironically, given that uh, uh, Fred Koch became one of America's most right-wing anti-communists, he made the beginning of his fortune by setting up oil refineries for Joseph Stalin. Another early customer for Freya's technology were the Nazis in Germany after 1933. He ended up building a refinery for Adolf Hitler that had to be green-lighted specifically for Hitler after he became chancellor in Germany. It became very important during World War II. Fred eventually set up Coke Industries in Kansas, investing in oil refineries. He had four sons, two of them Charles and David eventually took over running his company. Charles Koch has always been the dominant brother in the family. He's domineering, he's smart, um, and he's ruthless. And his younger brother, David, has been sort of more good-natured and going along with him. But the brothers also embraced their father's distaste for government regulation. They don't like the government, and they want the government to be smaller and disabled. That would help their business a lot if there was fewer regulations. Still by the 1990s, the brothers realized they needed clout in Washington. Coke Industries is becoming a huge company. It's a fossil fuel company with a horrendous record for environmental violations, and it runs smack into the new regulations that are being imposed by the Environmental Protection Agency beginning in the 80s. 
the Kochs wanted to change those laws. The 1996 presidential campaign. To do that, they set their sights on influencing the Republican Party. It's 1996. They, uh, David Koch is, at this point, goes from trashing conventional politicians to becoming the vice chair of, of Bob Dole's presidential bid on the Republican Party ticket. You'll get a better feel of who Bob Dole is and what he's all about. There was a big fight within the Republican Party at that time about whether or not Republicans should accept the reality of climate change and look to market-based solutions to fix it, or whether they should deny it. And one of the things that we know is that there was tremendous lobbying and advertising from the fossil fuel industry on the denial side. At the very time of that internal debate, the Kochs build a network of at least 17 think tanks and front groups to influence the entire political system, often referred to as the Cochtopus. The Kochs have created a multi-dimensional political apparatus to create a tectonic shift in American politics. The, the single most important thing to understand about the Koch network today is that it is uh, unparalleled in its complexity. Today, the Kochs fund a wide range of organizations, from the National Rifle Association, the Cato Institute, Heritage Fund, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Donors Trust, and the American Legislative Exchange Council. But its most powerful weapon is an organization called Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity is now the primary political front group that the Kochs founded and fund. It's just become a kind of a, a guerrilla army that is almost like a third party in the United States now. Housed in this office tower in Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from Washington, D.C., Americans for Prosperity strikes fear into the hearts of politicians. When Obama was elected, they emerged as the key force in driving the Tea Party. They grabbed it and they corporatized it. And appears on Fox News regularly. What we're going to have if this climate change legislation passes, uh, this cap and trade, or gas prices through the roof. Today, the Koch's political apparatus spends hundreds of millions of dollars during elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. And puts out tens of thousands of TV advertisements to get their chosen Republicans elected. Hey, Hagan, taking care of Washington insiders. The largest purpose of that money was to change control of Congress, to change control of the presidency, to elect Republicans. All told, Coke money has gone to more than half of all senators and nearly 40% of all congressmen. While it's still not known exactly the total they spent in the 2016 election, it's estimated to have been more than half a billion dollars. When the Kochs estimate how much they're going to spend, it's always sort of a dicey proposition because they end up raising and spending a lot more money than they say is for just overt partisan politics. And they say this is for issue-based advocacy. Either way, it's a huge increase from the $40 million Americans for Prosperity spent in 2010 to help Republicans win control of Congress during the midterms. In 2012, it had $400 million. Um, which was well above anything it had had prior to that. And in 2014, they spent $290 million to help the Republicans win control of the Senate. You have sold West Virginia out. Families are suffering. We know that Americans for Prosperity, just to name one group, had run 33,000 ads in tight Senate races around the country. The Kochs also hold conclaves twice a year, inviting fellow billionaires and hitting them up for cash. That club grew from just a few members in 2003 to now 400 to 450 of the richest, most conservative businessmen and women in America. And it's attracted all kinds of important dignitaries, too. Including Supreme Court justices and Republican stars like Ted Cruz, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, Marco Rubio. This is a great day for energy independence. And Mike Pence, the current vice president. So you get, as a major donor, you get to spend a weekend chatting with the person who's going to be making policy that could 
drastically affect your bottom line. One of the key purposes of this political apparatus is to ensure that no legislation is passed to curb the burning of fossil fuels. The Kochs have gotten over 170 members of the House to take a pledge that they will never support any legislation that places a tax on carbon. So they, they screwed up the entire House of Representatives for, you know, years. The Koch's influence on the Republicans on climate change is powerful. We had a period where a number of important Republican leaders, again, were coming to the fore saying this is real. By 2008, leading figures in the party, such as Mitt Romney, Senator John McCain, and Republican House leader Newt Gingrich, were calling for action on global warming. Gingrich even appeared in this ad with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, calling for steps to be taken. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. And then there was tremendous pushback from the Americans for Prosperity, which, as many people know, is the Koch brothers-funded um, political movement. Indeed, in 2011, Gingrich renounced the ad. First of all, it's probably the dumbest single thing I've done in this <laughs> I think they saw that as a bigger threat than Al Gore or Bill Clinton or anything on the left. And unfortunately, you saw a number of Republicans that once supported climate action suddenly ratcheting that back. And Republicans refused to toe the line such as Bob Inglis, a conservative congressman from South Carolina, pay a heavy price. Inglis had become convinced that climate change was real. And so when the evidence was in front of his own eyes, he changed his point of view, and he started speaking out about climate change. In 2010, when Inglis was running again for Congress, Americans for Prosperity swung into action during the primary. And he lost badly to a, a very underqualified candidate who the Koch uh, machine brought in. So he was, he was then uh, hung up in the public square as an icon of what happens when a Republican turns good on climate change. Another one of those icons, for example, was climate scientist Michael Mann at Penn State University, author of the famous hockey stick curve that visibly showed how humans had impacted climate change going back centuries. In 2005, Mann was attacked by a member of Congress. Joe Barton decided to use his authority as the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee to hold hearings, to subpoena uh, my personal records, all of my personal emails. Yet Greenpeace soon revealed that Barton, a Republican congressman, received money from the Koch's Political Action Committee and uh, they attempted to smear me in op-eds and conservative-leaning uh, newspapers. While the Kochs were attacking legitimate climate scientists, they were funding scientists who denied global warming was caused by burning fossil fuels. And I've been receiving money from whoever that wants to give me money. One of the key strategies is to recruit either scientists or people who pretend to be scientists. Sometimes they are actually scientists, but rarely scientists in the particular field. One example is Wee Hock Soon at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He believes that climate change is caused by variations in the sun and not CO2, and that more carbon in the atmosphere is good for growing plants. We sent a Freedom of Information Act request in to the Smithsonian, and we requested who was funding him. And eventually, after years of discussion, got back a list of his grants. Who might be funding your grants this year? I think so. In total, soon received $1.2 million from the oil industry, a large portion of which had come from the Koch brothers. In the correspondence between him and the industry, he speaks specifically about deliverables, about particular products, particular papers, making particular arguments that the fossil fuel industry um, wants. And yet Soon has no training as a climate scientist. His background is aerospace engineering. Dr. Soon has already talked about those issues on the stage today and in the past. When he was asked, he says, well, these are my authentic beliefs. I'm not being paid to say anything I don't believe. And that may well be true. The point is, though, that he's a complete outlier science. He has views that are shared by almost no one in the scientific community. Mr. Koch. No, excuse me, Mr. Koch. Um, you're wanted for climate crimes.
The Koch's funding of climate denial has not always gone smoothly. Physicist Dr. Richard Mueller at the University of California, Berkeley, was a global warming skeptic whom the Koch's backed. But in 2012, Mueller produced a study that concluded global warming was caused by carbon dioxide. So I was flabbergasted. Not only was global warming real and roughly consistent with what the previous groups had said, but the match to carbon dioxide and the, the, the fact that, that solar variability was not responsible. All of this activity to generate doubt is effective. According to a Yale survey, 70% of Americans believe global warming is real, but only 53% of those people think it's caused by human activity. Just 16% think climate change is something to be very worried about. I think we have very, very strong evidence in this case to support the conclusion that these campaigns have been highly impactful. So until quite recently, many Americans have thought that the science was unsettled, even though scientists will tell you that it's been settled for 20 years. So why would they think that? As a result, politicians are not taking action. And that includes Democrats. Even when the Democrats control both houses of Congress, they did little to address the crisis. Most Republicans in Congress, and even some Democrats, are very, very afraid to try to do something about climate for fear that they will be targeted by fossil fuel interests um, and that they could lose their seats. America will start winning again, winning like never before. The election of Donald Trump means fighting climate change in the United States has become more difficult than ever. After all, David Koch attended Trump's election victory party. But most significantly, one-third of Trump's transition team was made of a people who were linked to the Koch brothers' vast political network. Some of the folks who have had a pivotal role in Trump's campaign, his transition, and now his presidency, who have Koch network ties, include Donald Trump's very first campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, his vice president, Mike Pence, uh, his legislative affairs director, Mark Short, his secretary of education, Betsy DeVos, Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator, all the way down to Andrew Bremberg, the domestic policy director who worked at Freedom Partners, actually putting together the uh, executive order is that the Koch network would like a theoretical Republican president to sign. Other important Koch linked Trump officials include his former chief of staff, Ryan Priebus, Trump's campaign manager and current advisor, Kellyanne Conway, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and the head of the CIA, Mike Pompeo. I believe that we as an agency and we as a nation can be both pro energy and jobs and pro environment. And already, Trump and its new head, Scott Pruitt, want to cut the EPA budget by as much as 30%. Pruitt played a key role in persuading Trump to pull out of the Paris Accord. You have corrected a view that was paramount in Paris, that somehow the United States should penalize its own economy, be apologetic, lead with our chin, while the rest of the world does little. The Koch see Scott Pruitt as someone who is going to strip away some of the climate regulations that they see as limiting job growth and, it should be said, limiting their own company's ability to, uh, to do some of the things that it wants to do. And even if Donald Trump is removed from office before his term ends, waiting in the wings to replace him as Vice President Mike Pence, a strong champion of the Koch brothers' interests. This is not the way our democracy should be working. The incredibly powerful, rich people who spend this kind of money should be held accountable. They have polluted our public discourse. They have skewed media uh, coverage of the science of climate change. They have paid off politicians. Considering what this means for our health, for our kids' futures, for our planet, it is unconscionable that the Koch brothers are denying climate change and fueling this kind of anti-climate activity. The situation in Antarctica offers cause for concern as well. Scientists now fear if action is not taken to drastically cut greenhouse emissions soon, global warming will run out of control, with major extinctions around the globe. Large coastal cities such as New York and Tokyo underwater, 
and wars and conflict due to mass migration of people becoming the norm. The number of lives that will be lost because of the, the uh, damaging impacts of climate change um, in the hundreds of millions. To me, it's not just a crime uh, against humanity, it's a crime against the planet. In October 2016, seven of the world's top climate scientists warned the planet is on track to sail past the two degrees Celsius threshold for dangerous global warming by 2050. Even if all the countries that signed the Paris Accords fulfill their pledge, that model was created before a climate crisis denier was elected president of the United States.